Lift your voice to the Lord. Lift your voice to the Lord. Lift your voice to the Lord. I know you've exerted some energy this weekend, but you have a little bit more. Lift your voice to the Lord. Lift your voice to Him. of the Lord would you extend your hands to me and just begin to pray I ask you to open your spirit to the Word of God this morning father as we come before you we glorify you we magnify you we honor your presence we honor your Holy Spirit and we believe that transformation is happening in this very room in the name of Jesus we pray Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I honor the man and the woman of this house. Thank you. In all of the United States, Shiloh was one of the first places that allowed me to come as a preacher of the Word of God. And didn't limit me to what I had done in the past. And for those of you that love what I did in the past, I need more, more, more. Jesus, more of you I need so much more Jesus more of you and somebody likes to say quiero más 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 mi Cristo más de Quiero más, 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 mi Cristo más de ti. I 
I'll forever need more. And that is the truth. That is the truth. Every day, every day, every hour, every moment, every minute, every second. One of the first times I was here, God gave me the opportunity to preach a message called The Exchange. Because we can never believe that we have the strength, we have the power, we have the capacity to do what God has called us to do in this day and in this time. If you would go with me to Genesis 1, 26. I believe that this house is full of people that love the word of God. I believe that this is a people that can digest more than one scripture per preaching. So we're going to go through the word of God a little bit this morning. Because the glory of God that has been released in this room this weekend is for us to never, ever, 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 ever be the same. If we go back to the same foolishness like the woman of God said last night, we have some serious issues. When we look at the word of God, and you, I, I don't know if you know me or not, but if you would stay, I would appreciate that so much. I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm not a theologian. I am simply a pastor's daughter that got tired of running from God and gave him a yes. So I stand before you as a servant. Wanting to get to the end and hear God say, well done. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says, Then God said, Thank you for standing for the reading of the word. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. Somebody say rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27 says, so God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Somebody say them. Yeah. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28 says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Somebody say subdue. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God, add a blessing to the reading of your word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I am compelled this morning. to remind the body of Christ that we are in a very dangerous time and we're in a very dangerous hour. We come to conferences and we encounter the presence of God. We encounter the glory of God. We encounter the fire of the Holy Spirit. Not just to run, because I ran last night. Listen. My knees wanted to tell me my age this morning. I ran so much last night. Okay. When we run and when we shout and when we dance, I believe that things are shifted in the spirit, especially when the anointing and the power of God comes on you. See, you think, you, you think mother was just saying, hey, 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 hey. No, there were things that were shifting. With every hey, you got a little more delivered. Because things happen in the presence of God. And we have to understand that when we set an atmosphere for God's presence to move, God in five minutes in his presence can do more in your life than a, somebody preaching to you for an hour. Because it's like, a, it's like, 
Have you ever received um, a hard drive or somebody sends you a file by email and you literally open the file and it downloads in five minutes, but then it takes you five hours to read the document? It's kind of like that. You get in the presence of God and he gives you this download and the next thing you realize over the next five months, wait a minute, I'm not bound like I used to be bound before. Something happened in that moment. Something happened. I've been, I've, I'm walking different. I'm thinking different. There's a new anointing on my life. There's something that has shifted and something that is happening because you have to understand that we are the children of God. We are the representatives of the kingdom of God on the earth. We are the ones that God has chosen for this day, this time, this season. This life that you are living in is not about you paying your bills. This life that you are living in is not about your career. This life that you are living in is not about you just raising your children which even though that is important but that's not your only role this life is not about what you can accumulate this life is about being a servant of the most high God I was looking at mother as she prayed for us this morning before we came out and I said to my assistant Nicole I said my God what an amazing legacy to be in your 80s and to have lived your entire life serving the Lord and serving the kingdom of God and still standing strong and still praying at the altar and still coming and crying out before the Lord and still bringing the glory of God in the room if you gonna be tired be tired because you've been working for Jesus if you gonna lose your voice let it be because you are in the presence of the Lord saying hallelujah if you go see because other people are getting tired because they work in two and three jobs to put money in their pocket but how about we just get tired serving the Lord because you're going to be tired anyway people are tired working for a check that they spend in the next three days after they get it but when you work for the kingdom of God oh y'all gonna help me in here this morning Y'all done been in too much glory this weekend to let me preach by myself this morning. When you work for the kingdom of God, the reward that you receive is eternal. You get your blessing here and you get your blessing there. That's what I'm talking about. And the amazing thing about this is the fact that God sets us in the earth and he sets us in a generation and he sets you in a city and he sets you in a family and he sets you at a, at a corporate job as a representative of his kingdom. Even if you're cleaning the bathrooms, you represent the kingdom. Even if you're the nanny, you represent the kingdom. Even if they overlook you for the promotion, you represent the kingdom. See, we need to stop being all flustered and worried about the natural things. How about we put our eyes on the eternal things and say, God, why am I here? God, what is my mission? God, what is my assignment? You may be cleaning those bathrooms because in the near future, there's a woman that you're going to encounter while you're cleaning the bathroom and she's going to be at the point of suicide and the Holy Ghost is going to say, say something and you're going to say the right thing at the right time because you were in position as a representative of the kingdom of God walking in authority walking in anointing walking in power and walking with a prophetic message in your mouth you don't need the title prophet to be prophetic you just need to live in the presence of the Lord you live in the presence of the Lord you gonna walk with some power you don't need no title to have power you just need a relationship is there anybody in here listen they stoned Stephen and he wasn't an apostle he was a deacon serving tables and they got mad because he was doing what miracle signs and wonders we gotta get it right this is not about titles this is about kingdom and it's about authority Somebody say authority. When God created man, he created them, male and female, and he gave them authority so that they can rule, so they can subdue, so that they can have dominion, not one over the other. We were given power to subdue and rule circumstances, the culture, finances, 
the earth realm, the land, property, but we were not called to rule one another. That's why slavery was from the very pit of hell. Oh, Holy Ghost, really, you want me to say that? So if somebody is still putting on you a mentality of slavery because of the color of your skin, you better get free because you got some things to do. Don't nobody need to rule over you even in your mind except King Jesus. Not black people or white people because there's some black people that want to put you in bondage to the past. There's white people that want to put you in bondage to the past. But I'm talking to kingdom people that know who they are in Christ Jesus that walk in anointing and authority and say there ain't no system that can stop me because I'm a child of God and I represent the kingdom of God. And even when everybody else is broke, I can prosper. Because if God before me, who? Who? Authority, kingdom, power, subdue, take dominion. Now this is the part that messed me up because all of this, see I come here and I start feeling like a real preacher. And the Bible says, <laughs> listen, all of, the th all of the scriptures that I just read to you are in the first chapter of Genesis. Verse 26, 27, and 28. And I was studying and I'm reading. He woke me up at 5.30 this morning because I was, I was so tired from shouting and dancing and running last night. I couldn't even stay up and study. I said, Lord God, you're going to have to help me because I don't know what you want to say tomorrow. And I will not stand up here unless I know what he wants me to say. Okay? I will be like, Pastor K, I love you, but he didn't give me nothing. But he woke me up at 5.30 this morning. And he started laying all this out. And I was like, okay. So the first scriptures that we read were in chapter 1. And he said he created them, male and female, right? But then we go to chapter 2, verse 7, and it says, Then the Lord God formed man, but wait, I thought you said you already created them. I was like, wait, wait. Like I said, I'm not a theologian. I'm just giving it to you like the way I, I received it. It says in chapter 2, verse 7, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then man became a living soul. So why did he say in chapter 1 he created them, male and female, but then it says in chapter 2 that he formed the body of man and blew into him. Is it possible? Is it possible that God first created the design of man's spirit? male and female and deposited oh god i thank you into his spirit the dna the design man is gonna walk like me man is gonna talk like me man is gonna worship like me man is gonna create like me man is gonna take dominion and when i say man it doesn't mean man as in male it, it says he created them male and female i honor the man of god i honor the men of god I understand that men are recovering and are protection and they are needed, but let's not get it twisted. God created us at the same time. I am not women's lib. That is demonic and it is from the gates of hell. It is from the gates of hell. Everything that seeks to destroy the image of the man that God has placed as a protection and as a covering for the women of God is from the very pit of hell. Every movie that tries to make the husband look like an idiot, every joke that has the father as the butt of the joke, every I'm a boss chick, I'm a boss, sit down and get saved. You ain't no boss chick nothing. You are a child of the living God. And if you are blessed with a husband and blessed with a covering, even if he ain't in right standing with God, seek the face of the Lord so that God will position him so that your family can be great. Because what? It takes two to make a thing go right. Two. He made them. 
male and female. Then we go to chapter 2, and it says that he created the body of man, but the spirit was already designed and ready for the go. And then God created the body of man, and then he blew into man the breath of life. And the Bible says, see, that's when I start feeling like a preacher. The Bible says that man became a living soul. Great argument against abortion. That's a great argument. Man became a living soul, and man started to do his job, and man started to name the animals, and man started to move in his calling and in his purpose, and man started to function, and man started to do his thing according to what God had for him, and then God said to him, you know what, it's, it's not good for man to be alone, right? It's not good for, for man to be alone. That's in verse uh, 18. Genesis 2, verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. The Bible also tells us that God began to bring the animals to Adam, and he brought, and he paraded the animals, and, 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 and they found that among the animals, there was not a suitable companion for Adam. And God said, it's not good for man to be alone. And the Bible says, I will make a helper suitable for him. Sister, the word helper is not a curse word. In the same way that submission is not a curse word. I know that it's been used against you. I know that it has been mishandled. But we cannot throw away kingdom truth because people mess up the definition of what God intended. Just because your first husband used the Bible to abuse you doesn't mean that what God said is not true. God made woman because man needed help. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with needing a little help. That doesn't even mean that man is weak because he's not. That just means that he had a lot of work to do. And it's better for two to do the work than once. Come on. Many hands make light work. So let's stop all this foolishness. Well, well I, I'm the helper. You need me because you need a help because you don't got it all together. Be quiet, woman of God. We have to learn to, to, to move and operate with wisdom. When you have a husband who knows who he is in God and understands his job and understands his responsibility. And then you have a wife that understands that she was created also in the image of God to walk alongside that man. And the two of them live in a mutual submission as it is taught to us in the Bible. And the man is submitted to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. See, when the man is committed and submitted to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the wife has no problem submitting herself because as he is following Jesus Christ, now he's loving his wife as Christ loved the church church and he is giving himself for her how many of you would have a problem submitting to Jesus after he died on the cross for you not me Jesus you want my money here you go Jesus you want me to cook for you here you go Jesus you want me to clean for you here you go Jesus what you need because ain't nobody ever died for me like you did so what you need Jesus so when a woman has a husband that's saying, baby, you need me to get an extra job so we can get ahead. I'm going to do it. Baby, you need me to do this? Come on, let's do it. We can do this again. When a man loves his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, she is going to follow him to the end of the earth. So with all due respect, men of God, spend more energy doing than saying, I'm the head of this house and you need to submit to me. Because if you lead by example, she going to follow She gonna follow. You say we going on mission, she say, all right, let's go. You know why? Because she can trust you. I give Jesus my everything because he has proven to me that I can trust him. Man of God, prove to your wife that she can trust you and she will submit and she will follow you anywhere you go and anything you, that, and even when you're wrong, she will still say, we gonna be all right. Because at the end of the day, it's not about you having a cutesy wootsy relationship. At the end of the day, it's that God needs teams of people 
across the nation doing the work of the kingdom together standing side by side standing back to back sometimes one is in the front sometimes the other is on the other side working together because there is so much to do so much to do and we sitting up fighting well I'm the man then I should handle the money but if you don't handle the money well then stop it You handle the money, we ain't got nothing in savings. She handles the money, next thing you know, we got $3,000 in savings. Who has the anointing to handle the money? Follow the anointing, follow the grace, and stop being proud and arrogant so that your home can prosper. I don't know who this is for this morning, but I'm just, this is supposed to be a woman's conference. I don't know how the man got all tied up in this. But you know how you got tied up in this? Because there is a work that God has to do for both man and woman. Even for those that are not married and you're in your single season, be everything that God has called you to be. Because even in the body of Christ, there are other single people that you will labor with in the kingdom of God to do work for the kingdom. And the young single men will bring their gifts to the table to serve the Lord. And the young single women will come and bring their gifts to the table to serve the Lord. And then it makes the body of Christ whole. So this is not just for the married people, but it's about image. It's about authority. So watch this. Oh my God, what time do I need to be done? I don't want to go over. I got a little time? Okay, let me try to get through this. Okay, in Hebrew, the word helpmate or helpmeet is derived from two words. Ezer and Konegdgo. If I said that wrong, forgive me. Like I said, I'm not a scholar. Okay, Ezer appears 21 times in the Bible. In the Old Testament, Ezer is most often used to describe God being Ezra to human beings. So when the Bible says that he will make a helpmate for Adam, the Hebrew word is Ezer, which also means it's the same word that in other positions in the Bible is used for the word God. That doesn't mean that the woman is God. That just means that God created a helpmate for man because man was made in the image of God. So man was already, a, ye are gods in Psalms. Man was already a God that was walking on the earth because he wasn't created in the image of God. So he could not have a helpmate that was not equal to him in Godship. Does that make sense? That's like trying to have a God in the form of man working with a fairy that has limited power, limited authority, limited strength. For two to be partners, they have to be equal in strength and in power. But the way God designed it for husband and wife, for man and woman, is that we are equal in strength and in power but in different areas, so we are opposites. We're strong in opposite areas, and then when those strengths come together, when those strengths come together. That's why what she's good at, you're not good at. Don't be mad about it. Just praise God that somebody's good at it. When he's good at something and you're not, just praise God that somebody in the house is good at it. Let's stop worrying so much about what well, the man is supposed to do this and the woman is supposed to. How about we just work as a team and figure out who's good at it and whoever's good at it, let's just do that. Your marriage ain't got to look like your mama's marriage. Your marriage ain't got to look like your grandmama's marriage. Your marriage ain't got to look like your cousin's marriage. And definitely don't let it look like Will and Jada. Or Kanye and Kim. All right, let me get through this. Out of the 21 times that that word helper, Ezer or Ezer, or appears in the Bible, Eight of these times, it means savior. Uh, these examples are easy to identify because they're associated with expressions of deliverance or saving, okay? So sometimes helper, as in God being a helper, shows up as savior or salvation, uh, connected to deliverance. Elsewhere in the Bible, the root ezer or ezer means strength. The word is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it is used to describe God as a strength to man or to mankind. Also, the Bible uses the word Ezer two times. It describes as military support. Yeah. 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 Military support. So man of God, 
You're trying to do all these amazing things for the Lord. And God is put at your side. Somebody who is like God. Somebody who is strong. She may not be strong physically, but in the spirit there is a strength within her that is needed for what God has called you do, to do together. She has military strength and strategy. Strategy. So it is time for the unity to come together because at the end of the day, it's all about authority. It's all about subduing the earth. It's all about ruling. Okay, watch this. Man. Genesis 2 verse 21. It says, so the Lord caused the man to fall into deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with the flesh. Every time I saw this, I always imagined, you know, like when you eat ribs and you take out a bone. And so I always imagined that God put Adam to sleep and that he plucked out a bone and that he made Eve. But that's not what the Bible says. When you look at, you know, you got a Bible on your phone and next to the little word, it'll have like a number. Click the number because the number might take you to a definition or another scripture that's going to teach you something more. So I clicked on the little number that was next to man's rib and it says or took part of the man's side. So it wasn't that he took a rib out. He took a portion of the man's side, took it out, closed up the flesh because the DNA of what God had already created was in man. It's like a Petri dish. You start with something so that it will multiply. So he took that side of man and then created woman. He made them to complement each other. Okay? And then verse 6 in chapter 3 says, because this is when things start to get complicated. So woman is made. They're doing their thing. They're getting to know each other. And then we get to verse 6, and it says, Now when the woman saw the fruit of the tree, that it was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Okay, so we all know the story. God said, do not eat of the tree, do not do this, do not disobey, so on and so forth, right? And then we got woman who goes over, and she just starts kind of contemplating, and she has a conversation with the serpent, and did God really say? She grabs the fruit, and she eats the fruit, and then she takes up the fruit, and she gives it to her husband. Now, right now, I mean, right there, it is showing you the power that was given to woman as also a child of God, but she did not use wisdom. So my question to you this morning, woman of God, is what fruit are you feeding your husband? What fruit are you feeding him? Are you in his ear saying, nah, baby, we, we, we can't pay our tithe this month because we got bills to pay? Are you feeding him uh, a fruit of, of bitterness against someone that did something to him? Are you feeding him uh, fruit of rebellion? Because pastor didn't, pastor said he was going to have you do this, and pastor didn't do what he said he was going to do. And you're feeding him, you're feeding him. You should already be in a, in a different position. We've been in this church 10 years, and they still haven't put you in another position. I don't think that's right. We need to go somewhere where we're going to be appreciated because we're anointed too. What kind of fruit? Oh, y'all, y'all don't want to help me in here this morning. Oh, Lord, yeah, yeah, yeah. What kind of fruit? What kind of fruit are you feeding your husband? Because guess what, woman of God? As weak as you may think you are, you have influence. And you have a responsibility before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords with the husband that God gave you to make sure that you are influencing him according to the will of God, the mind of God, the heart of God. And if you don't do that, then you're going to be in trouble. Because if God has a call on that man's life and you ain't acting right, listen, God will remove you and bring somebody else. Because at the end of the day, it's about kingdom, it's about purpose, it's about what God needs to get done in the earth. And if you're going to get in the way of his purpose, he will move you out. What kind of fruit? You better be careful. You better speak life. You better speak obedience. You better speak submission to the will of God. You better speak peace, even regarding his baby mama. 
speak peace. Sow the right seeds. God is not a man to be mocked. Whatsoever a woman sows, that shall she also reap. What's coming out of your mouth? What kind of fruit are you feeding him? Because you're going to live in the harvest of the fruit that you feed him. I believe with all my heart that if Adam had said, you know what, no, this is not what we're doing, there would have been an opportunity for restoration because he was the head, he was the one that God had empowered and given the instruction, but he went along with it. So man of God, while she's trying to feed you that foolishness, you better push back that plate. I know that's your boo. I know you don't want her to shut down the bedroom door. I know you don't want her to send you to the couch. But what if she is saying is wrong according to the word of God? In love, you better check it. And you better push that fruit back and say, no, baby, that's not what we're doing. We go and bring our tithe to the Lord. No, baby, God called us to Shiloh. And I don't care if I don't ever get a position. I'm going to stay at Shiloh and I'm going to serve at Shiloh. And I'm going to be at the parking lot at Shiloh until God says otherwise. Don't you come to me with that poisonous fruit. Because I am going to live in the harvest of my obedience to God. It's on both sides. This is what it looks like when the Holy Ghost wakes you up and gives you a message. Because I don't preach this good, I promise. Listen, I'm almost done. Proverbs 14, 1 says, The wise woman builds her house, but with her hands, the foolish one tears it down. Now, this is the bottom line of what I want to explain to you this morning. When we talk about Adam and we talk about his wife and we talk about dominion and authority and the ability to subdue, when we see that sin comes into the picture... See, we're Pentecostal. Any Pentecostal people in the room? Right? So when we talk about sin, we always think about sin as being equal to hell. You sin, you go to hell. You sin, you go to hell. Oh, you living in sin, you're going to hell. You in sin, you're going to hell. Oh, you lied, you're going to hell. Everything is about going to hell. I have news for you this morning. Sin is not about you going to hell. Sin can lead you to hell. But sin is about stealing your authority. Because the enemy knows the love that God has for you. That's why he hates you so much. The enemy knows that if you sin, but you come back to the Father and you repent, he will forgive you of your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin when you confess your sin, right? So when he catches you up in sin... And what is it? Well, what is sin, Pastor Joanne? I ain't smoking, I ain't drinking, I ain't watching porn. What is sin? To know to do right and not do it. Mm. So sin is not about hell. Sin is about stealing your authority. So when the devil or the serpent came into the garden and he created this distance between God and man and woman, it wasn't about them going to hell. It was about the enemy being able to steal their authority, their inheritance, the power and the ability to subdue and take dominion. See, this is the reason why some of you are still struggling because that authority and that power and that dominion that has been given to you is dormant. God, I promise to walk in the authority that you have given me. Because there are some things that you are allowing in your house. There are some things that you're allowing in your mind and in your thoughts. There are things that you're allowing in your finances that are illegal. But because you're not walking in authority, there's nothing you can do about it. And the reason why you're not walking in authority is because you have sin in your life. And the enemy keeps presenting sin to you that looks good and tastes good and smells good is because he wants to steal your authority. He knows you can lay on your deathbed and say, Jesus, forgive me and go to heaven. But he would have stolen every opportunity that you were given throughout your life to exercise authority for the kingdom of God to subdue, to take dominion. And guess what? It is not just for man to take dominion, but it is for man to take dominion. It is for woman to take dominion. It's for the church to take dominion. It is for all of us to rule, subdue, and take dominion. You can lay on your deathbed, say, Jesus, forgive me, and go straight to heaven. But have never 
exercised the authority which means that while you were here there wasn't anything that you snatched back from the devil that belonged to the kingdom of God so when God tells you to go into real estate it's not just because he wants to make you a, bil a, a, a millionaire it's because he wants you to snatch back what belongs to God when you are in line for that promotion and God gives you that promotion and you're able to bring a greater tithe and a first fruit to the Lord it's not about you getting more rich it's about you taking back what belongs to the kingdom of God it is about you exercising dominion it is about you exercising authority it is about you snatching back what God placed on this earth for his children and as the children of Abraham we the church have to take back what belongs to the kingdom of God let's go to Luke I'm almost done it is 12 12 if you had coffee this morning you shouldn't be hungry just yet Luke 4 verse 5 says the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their. Wow. I, Satan, the devil, the one that fell, the created being is speaking to the creator. I will give you do you think you are I will give you authority what splendor as it has what been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to if you worship me it will all be yours who gave it to him who gave the devil the authority who gave him the possessions of the earth? Man was set on the earth and his inheritance was the earth. And they handed it over to the enemy. Not because they were sleeping around. Not because they was cussing and drinking. Simply because they disobeyed the voice of the Lord. And ate some fruit. And Jesus answered, verse 8, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Webster's Dictionary of 1828 describes worship as this. Worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. So Satan was saying to the creator of the universe, submit to me, love me, honor me. And I will give to you what was illegally given to me. And why did Jesus respond in the way that he responded? Because Jesus understood that there was a plan in place that would restore to the sons of Adam the authority, the power. So Jesus wasn't power hungry. Adam and Eve were power hungry. They didn't know that they were already like God. So the serpent comes and says to them, if you eat the fruit, you'll be like God. Hey, boo-boo, you already like God. You're already like God. So you can patiently wait to walk in what God has for you because what he has for you is already set. So Jesus was like, hmm. No, sir, because he knew what the enemy didn't know. The enemy came to tempt Jesus in a way that would have been, what's the word? That would have been tempting to Satan himself. You see, Satan wants power. Satan wants worship. Satan wants authority. That's why people would faint when Michael Jackson would come out, because it was worship. Ah, passing out. So Satan said, I can, I, can, I can tempt Jesus with this because surely, surely he'll want glory. Surely he will want power. Surely he will want authority. And Jesus was like, my worship is reserved. 
my submission is reserved to the one and true God. Let's go to Colossians. I told you I had a lot of scriptures, and I'm not going to apologize for that. Hopefully you took some notes so you can actually go study it for yourself. Because I would love for you to be convinced that this authority that we're talking about already belongs to you. And that you would walk in it. Verse 9 says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the work of God who raised him from the dead. Verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. Our legal indebtedness because of Adam and Eve, which stood against us and condemned us. See, it was that sin that took away and stripped our authority and our power and our ability to rule and have dominion. It was condemning us, and he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And I love this scripture, verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, I mean, triumphing over them by the cross. So he put them to open shame. We just celebrated Easter, right? Everybody came to church looking all cute. But what's the point of Easter? Yes, salvation. Yes, going uh, to heaven. But it is also for there to be a restoration of authority and of dominion and of power. But you're not going to walk in that authority and in that dominion and in that power until you really understand that that belongs to you. As a man thinketh in his heart, we've been hearing the word victim since Thursday. If you continue to live and think and move and operate and live as a victim, you are a victim. But when you embrace the identity and the authority and the power of God, that's when you're going to realize, I ain't got no time for sin. I don't have time to be angry. I don't have time to be bitter. I don't have time to chase rumors. I don't have time not to give my tithe. I don't have time not to serve. I don't have time to watch porn. I don't have time to mess around. I don't have time to do this and do that because every time I do, it is wasting precious time that I need to be able to move and operate in the authority that God has given me and there is work to do. I don't want this generation to come and go and God has to look for another generation to do what he wants to get done in the earth. How many more generations is he going to have to wait for? I pray not many more. Last scripture and I'm done. Luke 10, verse 19. This is the Amplified Bible. And you can stand to your feet. I'm done. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. The Bible says, behold, I have given you authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses and nothing shall in any way harm you. Lift your hands to the Lord right now. I pray in the name of Jesus that this morning your understanding is enlightened there is an authority and a power that has been given to you, that has been given back to you, that Adam lost. But Jesus came that we might have life.
and have it more abundantly. Jesus came that we would walk in authority. Jesus came that we would be able to command sickness to go. Jesus came. See, this is the reason why Jesus was able to walk around raising the dead because he was operating in a delegated authority. The Bible tells us that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is on the inside of you. So that same authority and power is on the inside of you. But if you don't believe it, man of God, you will continue to let society tell you that because you're a black man, you can't do this and you can't do that. The devil is a liar. You can do everything that God has called you to do. You can own real estate. You can have businesses. You can go back to school. You can be in ministry. You can go out into the streets. You can start a church. You can evangelize. You can go into corporate America. Even when man tries to put ceilings on you, God will raise you up because you understand the authority, the authority that is given to you in Christ Jesus because you spend time in the face of God. And in the face of God daily, God reminds you who you are. And who you are has nothing to do with the color of your skin who you are has nothing to do with who might try to close the door on you who you are has everything to do with the fact that the God that created the doors will create a door for you and put your name on it and he'll close it for somebody else but he'll open it for you because there's a work to do so father in the name of Jesus the enemy thinks he's so slick and he keeps trying to trap us in disobedience and he keeps trying to trap us in rebellion and he keeps trying to trap us in anger and pride and fear he keeps trying to trap us in sin because he wants our authority to be disabled he wants our authority to be paralyzed but I declare prophetically in the name of Jesus that in this house, every man of God and every woman of God is going to seek your face like never before. I declare in the name of Jesus that every man of God and every woman of God is going to step into the authority that God has declared over them. I declare that every man of God and every woman of God is going to take inventory of their life and they're going to get rid of everything that is a hindrance and they're going to say, oh no, no more. No more fear, no more doubt, no more anger, no more bitterness. I don't have time for this. And we are going to step in to the authority. We're going to exercise authority authority over our children we're going to exercise authority over our finances we're going to exercise authorities in the school system we're going to exercise authority in our community we're going to exercise authority on the job we're going to exercise authority in every situation and we are going to establish the kingdom of God on the earth because you sent us here as your children this is our inheritance and it all belongs to you Say with me, dear God, I promise with the help of the Holy Spirit to walk in the identity and in the authority that you have given me as your child. I will be bold. I will walk in authority. I will rule and take dominion. I will bring down the promises of God to manifest the kingdom of God on the earth and if you are looking forward to the things that God is going to allow you to conquer I want you to clap your hands with excitement I want you to shout unto God I want you to declare over your house over your family over your marriage that you will rule you will walk in authority you will subdue and every devil in hell that tells you that you will not move forward you can look him in the face and you can laugh and you can say oh no sir God has an authority for me and my family my house and my children and we are going to snatch back everything 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 I declare that everything that has your name on it in this season is related Release to you in this season and oh masi raba kashatiara rebe keseteri ala la la basanda oh raba kete rebe sanda la la baki torobosha every hindrance every blockage every enemy that has risen up against you I declare that as you line yourself up with God your authority will make way for you your authority will open doors for you your authority will will give opportunity where others don't have opportunity because you understand that everything that you conquer is to snatch back 
what belongs to the kingdom of God. God bless you. I love you. Walk in your authority.